All right. Hey, everybody. Sisterhood, we are super pumped for you to join this conversation Woo! today. I'm so excited about Oh, yeah. This. With someone that we love and have been following for a very long time, Ali Vestucki. We're so excited to have this conversation with you. I am so excited to be here. So you just had a book come out. You, you're not enough, and that's okay. And I just yeah. have to say, that title in and of itself is going to have some people going, whoa, <laughs> Hello, what is she talking about? That is not okay to say that. <laughs> so we're going to unpack a little bit about what that's about and how you came to write this book and even this topic, um, how you came to do this. But before that, we want to get to know you a little bit. So kind of tell our sisterhood a little bit about who you are. Yes. Yeah, so my name is Allie Stuckey. As you guys know, since you just said, I host a podcast called Relatable. We analyze culture, news, politics from a biblical perspective. I have been in this kind of media realm for almost five years now. I started speaking actually to sorority girls on college campuses about why they should vote. And then it kind of evolved into political, cultural commentary. And of course, I've been a Christian all that time. And so I try my best to uh, look at all of the issues that are going on right now, whether they be political, cultural, theological, from a biblical perspective. And a couple years ago, I was approached by my publisher, Sentinel, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House, asking me if I was interested in writing a book. And I was. And through a lot of brainstorming and processing and looking at the things that are not only most important to me and my audience, but some of the biggest, I would say, cultural threats to young Christian women, we kind of decided, we just kind of fell upon this one topic that I'm really passionate about. And it is the mythology surrounding the love of self and self-fulfillment, self-empowerment that is not only popular in uh, worldly circles and secular circles, but also unfortunately within the so-called uh, Christian church. And so that is the short of it. That is a little bit about who I am and um, just in general, how we kind of came upon the topic of this book. That's so good. I know brainstorming for books and <laughs> landing on a topic can be hard. I remember with our first book, Girl Defined, it was yeah. like, ah, but then it's so exciting when you land on yeah. it and you just see, you know, everything come together and you're like, yes, this is what it's supposed to be. But your book, You're Not Enough, so when someone hears the name of that book, they might think, okay, I'm really struggling. Maybe I'm struggling with yeah. anxiety or I just, you know, have low self-esteem or whatever it is that they're saying to themselves. And they, someone says, here, read this book. You're not enough. It can almost seem offensive. Like, wow, how is this supposed <laughs> to help? Or someone wanting to give someone this book, like, won't this be more hurtful than helpful? But yeah. from your perspective, it's actually more helpful to tell someone you're not enough. So can you kind of unpack that to help us kind of clear the <laughs> fog like wait this seems backwards <laughs> yes so the full title of the book is you're not enough and that's okay escaping the toxic culture of self-love and the title is supposed to be like that it's supposed to have that a little bit oh i'm kind of offended reaction because i like <laughs> that people will read that and they're like, okay, I've been hearing for so long that I am enough. Now someone's telling me I'm, I'm not enough. Okay. Well, maybe I'm interested in that because I've been told that I'm enough my entire life or at least for the past 10 years. And I still don't feel good about myself. Okay. Like I'm still insecure. I'm still paranoid. I still struggle with anxiety. I still struggle with self-loathing. So maybe the answer is in the other direction. Now I do want to clarify and I make this clear in the book that when we talk about these things, the, the danger of the culture of self-love, what I actually call the cult of self-affirmation, my antidote to those things is not self-hatred. It's not self-deprecation. It is not self-loathing. It is um, seeing ourselves as God sees us, replacing very superficial and unsatisfying self-love with unconditional and satisfying God's love. So that's what this book is about because the reality is, is that self-loathing and uh, this constant uh, focus on our flaws, self-deprecation is really just the other side of the self-obsessed coin, which is also a sin for the Christian. We are called to self denial, not self-hatred, not self-obsession and self-fulfillment, but self-denial, seeing our identity, not in what the world tells us and not in what we tell ourselves, but in what God tells us. And as of, as you guys know, of course, when you are in Christ, you are a child of God, you are an heir with Christ, you have a new identity and a new self. So this book is combating the five cultural myths 
Mm -hmm. that are centered on this idea that if you love yourself, you'll finally be successful and happy and replacing them with God's truth, which is not that you should hate yourself, but that you should have an identity that is so much more fulfilling, so much more purposeful and satisfying and eternal in Christ. Yeah. And that's so opposite when you first hear it, but I love how you unpacked that, that it's not yeah. that you're hating yourself. You think, oh, well, if I'm not enough, the opposite is I've got to hate myself or love myself, but I love how you bring Christ and really the gospel into the center of the conversation and say, as Christian women, this yeah. is God's love for us. This is how to rightly embrace his design right. in scripture. So let's talk about some of those myths though. Um, before we get into those, I would just love to hear, and I know our, our audience would too, just a snippet of your personal life and what ways maybe were you believing the lie that like, yes, I am enough. And how did God change that in your own heart, in your own life? So these messages, so for example, some of the myths that I address in the book, obviously you're not enough. Um, you determine your own truth. You're entitled to all the dreams that you have. You have to uh, love yourself before you can love other people. These are lies that are specifically targeted to young women because they sound good to us because we do deal with very real feelings of insecurity, very real feelings of self-deprecation and like we can't ever measure up. We are constantly comparing ourselves either to advertisements or what we see on TV or what our ex-boyfriend said that we should be and all of these things. These are very real feelings that we have. And so the culture of self-love and this very vapid phrase that you are enough is probably a well-meaning uh, antidote to those things or an attempt at an antidote to those things um, by the secular world. The problem with that is, is that it's not true, um, is that we are not enough because if we were enough, we wouldn't need Jesus Christ to die for us and to save us. We would be able to save ourselves. We wouldn't need any reliance on God's providence or provision, but God made us not enough to depend on him. I realized that for myself, and I realized that I was believing a lot of those lies when I was in college. So I was a, a good girl in college. I was, I was chaplain um, in college uh, in my sorority. I was the designated driver. I was the Bible study leader. I mean, I was part of what I called like, well, I kind of called it this cynically, like the God squad when I was <laughs> And I was, um, I was dating someone and he was super godly too. And how we met just seemed so providential. Like we were just this great godly Christian couple. And I thought that, okay, well, we're going to get married and everything is going to be happily ever after the whole time I was dating this person. And really a lot of the time that I was in college, I was actually still really dealing with a lot of insecurity and a lot of identity issues, not really feeling like I had solid footing on the word of God. And who I was in Christ, kind of secretly struggling with doubts and self-doubt, doubt, uh, doubts about the word of God and doubts about the Bible, but not wanting to reveal that because my identity wasn't actually in Christ. It was wrapped up in this kind of um, reputation that I had of being a godly girl. And this boyfriend that I had was really a part of that, even though I knew that I shouldn't be with him because I just, honestly, we weren't compatible. So that relationship ended when I was a senior in college. And because that was a part of this identity and this persona that I had been perpetuating for three years of being this perfect godly girl who has it all together and leads all the Bible studies, when I didn't have that relationship anymore that I thought was going to end very, or that I thought was going to conclude very quickly in, you know, engagement and, and marriage, part of that identity and that persona fell away. And I was left questioning, not just myself and my, you know, self-worth as it's called, but also my faith and who I was in Christ. And I decided um, very unfortunately and very tragically that I was going to go the way of the world, that all my friends who had been partying for about four years and had told me, you know, it's just college. Let's just have fun. Like you just need to go on different dates. You need to hang out with different guys. You need to get drunk and do all of these things. I thought, you know what? I've been a good girl for three and a half years. Maybe my last semester of college now that I'm single for the first time in college, maybe I should just, uh, you know, just do these things that everyone says um, is going to make me happy. And these probably well-meaning friends told me all the things that you hear self-love uh, people say that, you know, the reason why you're sad or the reason why you're feeling rejected is because you don't love yourself enough. You're not doing enough of what makes you happy. You're not doing enough of what feels good to you. You just need to tell yourself that you're enough. You need to work on yourself, work out more, uh, have fun, go out, be hungover. Who cares? It's just college. Just have fun. 
Um, and so I did those things and I told myself those things and I, I did the whole drinking and party scene. I started working on myself. I worked out twice a day and basically stopped eating to the point to where I had an eating disorder uh, that I could not maintain anymore. So I'm going out multiple nights a week, getting drunk, getting hung over, hanging out with different guys. Uh, I have an eating disorder that I couldn't maintain that eventually developed into bulimia all this time telling myself that this is what it means to love myself. Like this is what it means to be enough. This is what it means to really, you know, find myself and, and be single and whole on my own only to end up, I guess, eight months after this whole thing started in a counselor's office with her telling me, Hey, you physically cannot maintain this lifestyle anymore or else you will die. And me realizing, Oh my gosh, in just a year, I have, completely gone wayward. I've completely gone the other direction, all in the name of self-discovery and self-fulfillment. So I don't want to spoil too much because yes. there are many details about it in the book, but that's how I myself realized that in the pursuit of the self, in the pursuit of self-fulfillment and self-affirmation, all these things the world says will make us happy, I ended, I went to a dead end. Like I realized that I wasn't enough for myself, that self-love and self-discovery actually ended up in the completely opposite direction than where I wanted to go. It was the opposite of satisfaction and joy that I found. And by the grace of God, like I am so thankful to Jesus Christ for rescuing me and giving me the grace to be able to repent. He didn't have to do that, but he did. So this book is really about my own experience as well with the dead end of self-love. That's, I love that you shared yeah. that. And I know that's so relatable to, oh, so, I know. <laughs> so relatable to yeah. our audience and just what mm -hmm. so many young women are going through. And I can totally relate as well to just, you know, kind of the good Christian girl growing up. And I think there's so much freedom that yeah. comes when you realize, wow, I'm not enough. That's okay. And that's why Jesus, that's why yeah. I have a relationship with him. That's why I died on the cross and mm -hmm. rose again, because I don't have to measure up. I don't have to be good enough. And I, I know from personal experience that that is the most mm -hmm. freeing thing to yeah. give up, even though it seems like holding on to control is better. It's ultimately, Surrender. yeah, mm -hmm. it's ultimately just going to lead to destruction because we all have to go to bed at night and we all know like what's truly in our hearts. We all know all, you know, about ourselves. And so it's like, if that's what we have to rely on and count on mm -hmm. ourselves being enough, that to me is just a very depressing way to live. Um, mm -hmm. I do want to dig into another one of your myths and we don't want to give too much away. So girls, you have to go grab the book. Mm -hmm. You're not enough by Ali. That's stucky because it's awesome. Um, but I want to dig into the myth. You say myth number two in your book, you determine your truth. And I have heard this mm -hmm. so much lately. I feel like the, the phrase follow your truth is just everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's like that, you know, that's not me, but you follow your truth. Is right. that true for you? Go for it. Why is that a myth? Cause it is so popular right now. So typically what people mean by that is that their truth is their experience or what they feel. And there's nothing wrong with experiences and talking about your experiences. Of course, I, I just did that. And a lot of times people are talking about past trauma or abuse or something like that. And of course, we believe in transparency. And as Christians, we believe in the power of, of uh, testimonies. But it's important that we are very precise as Christians uh, with our terminology. If you're sharing a testimony, you're sharing a testimony. If you're sharing an experience, you're sharing an experience. But experience uh, does not equal objective truth. If everyone's subjective experiences is objective truth, uh, then what you have is um, a bunch of moral relativists unable to actually agree on what objective truth and objective morality is. That is a very confusing, chaotic world in which Christians don't have to live and we should not live. Again, experiences are important, but the objective truth is found in the word of God. And again, how gracious is God that he doesn't make us just flounder around wondering whose truth is the real truth that we should follow. Um, but he gives us objective morality. He gives, he gives us objective truth, not just in the word of God, but in Jesus Christ himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one can come to the father except through me. Jesus says, uh, the truth will set you free. So truth, objective truth, not just our experiences are important for us to be able to live orderly and peaceful lives. And we see the ramifications of uh, a culture that is 
uh, that runs on moral relativism or this idea of my truth and your truth. And one example of that is, is cancel culture. Cancel yeah. culture is the idea that if you, you know, you don't reach a, a certain secular standard today that wasn't even around yesterday, that mm -hmm. you're canceled, that you should lose your job, that you should lose everything that you love. Not just that you should be rebuked, but that your life should actually and uh, absolutely uh, be uh, ruined. And that is, uh, that's what morality looks like when it's defined by the mob, when it's defined by your truth and my truth, rather than the objective truth of what God's word is. God tells us what justice looks like, what true love looks like, what marriage is supposed to look like, what sexuality is. All of these questions that the culture is like, oh, in 2020, we don't know anymore the answer to these questions. Well, God has been saying what these things are since the beginning of time. And so it's a freeing for Christians yes. not to be bound by your truth or my truth, because Jeremiah 17, 9 says that our hearts are desperately sick. They're desperately wicked. Who can understand them? If you and I have to follow our truths, our hearts, we are constantly going to be confused. We're constantly going to be thrown into chaos, but God gives us relief from our own inner turmoil in the clarity and the objectivity of his word. Yes. And praise God for that. Right. I mean, what if he didn't, he didn't have to, but he did. He gave us his word and gave us Jesus Christ. And yeah. there's so much clarity and freedom as I mean, we've seen that in our own lives, as we've looked to ourselves, yeah. like you said, you don't land in a better place. And that's, yeah. that's the lie of our hearts, the lie of the enemy, right? Like follow your own truth and you'll yes. land in a better place, but it's the opposite. So that's so important to understand. We're almost out of time, but I think that, um, something that we've heard a lot, especially as we've talked to so many young women from all around the world is this idea that you have to love yourself first before you can love others. And we know you unpack this in your book, so don't give us all the details, but just in a nutshell, why is that a myth? Well, there's a, a myth that is unfortunately pretty popular within the Christian church, and that is that love your neighbor as yourself, as Jesus tells us to do, means that you have to love yourself before you love your neighbor. But C.S. Lewis explains this really well in Mere Christianity when he says loving your neighbor doesn't mean feeling affection for your neighbor in the same way that you might or might not feel affection for yourself. The way that Jesus is telling us to love our neighbor, um, the love that he's talking about is the persistent looking after our own interests and needs. So in the same way that we are constantly going to meet our own needs, we're constantly going to uh, satiate our hunger or our thirst or whatever deeper need that we want. Even people who hate themselves and who struggle with self-loathing, uh, they are still looking in some way to meet their own needs and to meet their own happiness and to relieve themselves in some way. So Jesus is saying, just as you persistently look after your own needs and your own interests, look after the needs of your neighbor. And so we don't have to wait around. Again, this is the free and truth that the gospel brings us. We don't have to wait around until we're not insecure anymore. We don't have to wait around until we're not anxious anymore or until we like have finally accepted the cellulite on our thighs. Yes. We don't have Hallelujah. To, we don't have to wait around for that or else we would never love other people. And there are people that are in need of our love right now. There are hungry people. There are people who need clothing. There are elderly people, lonely people, disabled people, vulnerable people who need our love right now. And this is a word that is very, you know, thrown around right now, which is privilege. But I can't think of anything more uh, blindly privileged than saying, well, no, I can't love or serve that vulnerable person until I can look in the mirror and really like the color of my hair, like really be confident in myself. That is a very naive and short-sighted view. Thank God, truly, thank God that the apostles, that the martyrs, that the missionaries, that the church founders didn't think that way or else we wouldn't have Christianity. So thank goodness that God frees us. The Bible says the love of Christ compels us to love other people. Well, if you're a Christian, you already got the love of Christ. You don't need self-love to compel you to love other people. It's Christ's love that compels us to love other people. And if you are a Christian, you have that in spades. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. Well, I know that if the sisterhood, everyone who's watching right now, they're thinking like, oh my goodness, this sounds <laughs> really awesome and really maybe hard in some ways, countercultural, mm -hmm. but really freeing and exciting and hope filled. So girls, if you're watching this, go grab a copy of You're Not Enough and That's Okay by Ali Beth Stuckey. I know that it will be a huge mm -hmm. blessing to you and really just challenge yeah. a lot of kind of how we all are tempted to think and the lies we're tempted yeah. to believe. So I really encourage you to go get that. Now, Ali, where can they find you? Where can they get your book? How can they connect with you and keep up with you? 
Yes, of course. So I am on all the social media. You can find me on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, and you can find the link to my book in all of those places. But you can go to amazon.com. You're not enough and that's okay. You can support your local Christian bookstore or any kind of local bookstore that might carry the book. I encourage you to do that. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's Ali Beth Stuckey. You can also watch my podcast and some other videos that I do there. And just thank you guys so much. Thank you to you guys for uh, sharing me and this message with your audience. I'm so thankful for what you guys do in showing young girls Christ. Um, I, I know from experience that it's not easy. And I happen to know from experience the kind of pushback that you guys get, that I get. It's some, you know, some of the same people that are pushing back against the message that we are sharing. But there's uh, so much freedom in knowing that our identity comes from a Heavenly Father who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's true for all the Christians watching this as well. So um, be confident in that. Find your hope in that. Find your assurance and your satisfaction in that, even as uh, the world gets crazier and crazier. And we we will remain anchored and steadfast in that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ali, yeah. for joining us. Girls, go grab a copy of her book. We'll link everything below yeah. so you can find her directly. So no excuses for not going to listen to her podcast. I can, <laughs> I can tell you, I was just... We'll have a little um, fangirl moment, especially for our younger sisters. My youngest sister, who is 17, Susanna, she, we told her, oh, we're going to, you know, interview Ali Bastek. And she was like, I am her biggest fan. I listen to every podcast, you know, so I know there are already some who are watching who are huge fans. Um, yeah. And I know it's been so encouraging, not only for us, but seeing our younger sisters directly be mm -hmm. encouraged is mm -hmm. awesome. So thank you for what you're doing. Keep it up. We are praying for you and praying for this book that it would spread yeah. far and wide. Girls, go check it out. We'll see you next time.